The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let's get started. OK, so this is actually our goal uh, for AO3, so you can see uh, during the exam number one, we have covered the first half of the goal, and we are actually making progress uh, to learn about boundary conditions in one-dimensional system and also in two-dimensional system today. And we will actually talk about phenomena related to electromagnetic waves and the optics uh, today, uh, which we will be able to learn uh, two very important fundamental law related to optical uh, Opti uh, optic, uh, uh, related to uh, uh, geometrical uh, optics. Okay, so that's actually the excitement. And uh, we started the discussion of two-dimensional or three-dimensional wave last time. And uh, actually, it, just in case you haven't realized that, there are two ways to go to higher dimension. Okay, so the first, the first way is to increase the number of objects and place that in two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. And that is actually the kind of thing which we will discuss today. Uh, so for example, I can have particles arranged in two dimensions, which form a membranes. And we can also, on the other hand, change the direction of the electromagnetic wave, for example, as a function of time. And that's another way to go to a higher uh, dimension. And today, as I mentioned before, we are going to talk about the first case. And on, the, on Thursday, we are going to talk about the second way to go to higher dimension, which is related to polarization, etc. OK? In general, higher order uh, dimensions are hopeless. OK? They are super complicated. And uh, in general, we don't really know how to solve this kind of system. Uh, fortunately, okay, in L3, what we have been doing is uh, uh, focusing on a small subset of questions, uh, which are actually highly symmetric. Therefore, we can actually solve it analytically. So that would be the focus of uh, L3, and so that we can actually learn some physics intuition out of this kind of highly idealize the system. And uh, the system which we are going to focus on today is shown here. It's a two-dimensional system which you have array of masses uh, placed in the x and y, uh, 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 x, y plane. And, uh, and uh, that is actually the system we are going to uh, solve today. And uh, we'll see that we'll learn a lot of interesting phenomena uh, coming from the solution of this kind of system. Before we start the discussion of two-dimensional system, I would like to remind you uh, what we have already learned from lecture eight. So that was about a system with, which consists of infinite number of mass and the infinite number of strings. And uh, each string has string tension t. And the, all the mass, when they are in equilibrium position, they, the distance between all those mass in the x direction is a. Okay, so we have solved this system before with uh, tra space translation symmetry. Okay, and this is actually just a reminder that the dispersion relation which we got a lot of time, omega as a function of k, is t over n a sine at k a over two. So that was just a reminder of what we have learned from lecture eight. So by now, you should realize that, OK, this dispersion relation is, is unusual, right? This is actually uh, telling you that this is a dispersive median, right? Because if you calculate the ratio of omega in k, you see that this is actually not a constant. OK, so that after all the discussion from previous lecture, you should be able to immediately realize that. And uh, any uh, waves propagating on this kind of system will be, uh, uh, there will be a dispersion uh, 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 phenomena happening in this kind of system. Okay? And uh, 
Also from the previous lecture, we have learned that the eigenvectors uh, based on space translation symmetry is exponential i k x, uh, where x is actually defined as uh, j times a, where j is actually a label to tell you what which mass I was talking about. Okay. Now, today we are going to uh, extend this uh, to a two-dimensional system. So, so instead of a one-dimensional uh, system, we have a two-dimensional array. Uh, so all the little mass all have mass equal to m, and they are placed in a xy plane. Okay. The coordinate system which I define is uh, here. Uh, x is horizontal and the y is uh, vertical. And the z is actually pointing to you. Okay? And all those little mass can only oscillate uh, toward you or uh, uh, going away from you, so in the z direction. Okay? It can only up, <coughs> oscillate up and down in the z direction. Okay? And in this system, we have the, the length scale, which is actually the horizontal distance between mass, is, uh, is called AH. And the, in the vertical direction, the scale, uh, the dip distance between mass is AV. Okay? Also, we have string tension, uh, two different kinds of string tension for the vertical and horizontal direction. The vertical direction, you have string tension TV. And uh, in the horizontal direction, you have string tension TH. Okay, so how do we actually describe this kind of system, right? The first thing, as we did before, is to label all those uh, little mass, right, by uh, my label. And my label is actually called Jx and Jy, which actually tells you uh, which uh, mass I was talking about uh, in, in this uh, system. Okay, once I have defined that, uh, the labels, I will be able to write the, the position of all those mass, the x direction position and y direction position in terms of j and the a, right? So for example, x position of one of the mass will be uh, written as jx times ah, and the y position of a specific mass, you can actually write it down in terms of jy times av, okay? So all those things are, should be pretty straightforward. The interesting part is that, as we actually identified in the last lecture, uh, this system is highly symmetric. It has tran space translation symmetry, right? Therefore, we can actually immediately figure out what will be the eigenvectors for this uh, uh, system. So the eigenvector, very similar to what has been discussed here, where you have a one-dimensional space translation symmetric system, exponential i k x was the eigenvector. Now you have eigenvector which is actually in two dimension, right? Because you would like to describe not only the x direction but also y direction. And the eigenvector have exactly the same functional form because of space translation symmetry. And it is actually like exponential i k x times x. Uh, multiply that by another exponential function, exponential i k y times y. Okay, so I think for, uh, until now nothing should uh, surprise uh, surprise you because this is actually uh, what we have learned from the one-dimensional system analysis. Based on what we have learned before, we can also immediately write down what would be the dispersion relation. Since we are always considering very small vibration, okay, and this actually uh, this uh, formula is still uh, applies, therefore you can actually write down the dispersion relation already, uh, omega uh, square uh, omega uh, uh, square k will be equal to four p h over m a h sine square k x a h divided by 2 plus 4 t v divided by m a v sine a square k, k y a v divided by 2. 
OK? So this is actually uh, 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 pretty uh, straightforward. And, uh, and you can see that the, on the omega is a function of uh, both uh, 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 kx and the ky. From the, eigen, uh, from the eigenvector, we can also write down what would be the possible uh, psi xy. Now the psi is actually the displacement in the z direction, right, with respect to the equilibrium position. And uh, that is actually proportional to the eigenvector. So basically, it's actually going to be a exponential i kx times x, exponential i ky times y. OK? And of course, I can write these two terms together, right? So basically, what I, what I will get is a exponential i k is a vector times uh, uh, r, which is a vector. So basically, k uh, contains two components, kx and ky. And R have also two components, which is uh, X and Y. OK? Again, we see that this is actually a non-dispersive median. OK? And uh, what we are going to do is to make linear combination of all those eigenvectors and to figure out what would be the behavior of uh, uh, when, when uh, this uh, system is oscillating at a specific uh, uh, frequency omega, and that is actually the corresponding normal mole at the angular frequency omega. Okay, so that is actually pretty similar to what we have done for a wide dimensional system. Okay, so just a reminder so this is actually two dimensional system. Just a reminder about one dimensional system for, for, for a while. So, so that there are two eigenvectors which actually have identical omega, right? So the first one is exponential i k x, and the second one is actually exponential minus i k x. What we have done before is to do a linear combination of the two exponential function, right? So what we can do is that, OK, now I can actually create cosine k x, right? This is actually 1 over 2 exponential i k x plus exponential minus i k x. And I can also create sine k x. And this is actually 1 over 2 i exponential i k x minus exponential minus i k x, right, for this one dimensional system. So that's actually how we figure out that the sh when this system is in one of the uh, normal mode, the shape of the system is like a cosine or a sine. Or in general, you can add these two together. And in general, it can be something like cosine kx plus phi. And phi is actually uh, some f uh, uh, phase uh, uh, angle, which we, you can actually figure out by uh, boundary condition. Okay? But before we introduce any boundary condition, all the k values all the five values are allowed, right? Just a reminder about what we have learned before, OK? So the situation is pretty simple. You have just plus and minus k, and then you make linear combination of these two. Then you know what would be the, the, the shape of the uh, normal mode, OK? On the other hand, we are now talking about two-dimensional case, OK? So let's take a look at this dispersion relation. OK, the dispersion relation we have here, omega, is a function of kx, is a function of ky as well. OK, what does that mean? That means I can have multiple choice of kx and ky, which they all produce the same omega value. OK, so it's not as simple as this one anymore. As you can see, right? Because when I slightly increase kx, okay, what I could do is, okay, I can slightly reduce ky to compensate the, the difference. Therefore, I can still keep omega, which is the angular frequency of the oscillation, the same. Okay, so that can be seen from this 
demonstration on the slide, you can see that this is actually one example uh, dispersion relation. Okay, this is actually the formula which we have on the board. And uh, what about if I set all those parameters and get uh, example omega squared equal to phi sine squared kx and the plus five sine uh, squared ky. Uh, okay, so what, what will happen? Okay, if I set my uh, a, H, T, and the M value so, so that I have this example. What will happen if I have that dispersion relation? So if I go ahead and the plot the allowed KX and KY value, which give one, you see very beautiful pattern, right, from this, right? So you can see that, ha, huh, actually, all those things on the, the, the circle can produce the angular frequency of omega equal to one. And what would be the, the yeah, what would be the normal mode will be all possible linear combination of, of all those uh, possible kx and y pair. You have a question? Uh, we're having this because you're considering a symmetric case, right? Symmetric mesh. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, in general, I think this, uh, you mean a circular shape or? I think in general, yes, you, you, you do have degeneracy, right? Because you can, uh, but, but the shape will not be circular, for example, right? So in, in general, uh, okay, so it can be a general function, which is uh, like uh, the, the, the formula above, right? But you can still, this argument still applies, right? So if you have some intermediate omega value, you can always slightly increase omega, uh, kx and slightly decrease ky, and that will still satisfy the same omega value. Therefore, all the normal modes with a specific omega will be a linear combination of all those possible normal modes. If you, uh, all those possible kx and ky pairs, if you have an infinitely long system, okay? And uh, that also applies to uh, uh, the other example, when I have omega equal to five, then you have slightly different behavior, but the, the take home message is that there are many, many pairs of KX and KY which can put, uh, cre uh, create the same amount of uh, omega, okay? So that makes things pretty complicated, but actually we can always uh, 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 still uh, try to understand this by uh, investigating all the possible K pairs of KX and KY. On the other hand, okay, as, you, as what we have discussed before, before you introduce boundary condition for the one-dimensional system, okay, there are infinite number of possible k value, right? All the possible k values are allowed. But after you add boundary condition, for example, uh, I add walls around this system, okay, so that uh, I basically have uh, fixed uh, boundary condition. So basically, the boundary condition is that the amplitude at x equal to zero, y equal to zero, or x equal to phi a times h, uh, uh, phi a h, or y equal to four a b, okay? At the boundary, the amplitude has to be equal to zero because it's attached to a wall, right? Okay, when this happen, this means that we will have uh, uh, four, uh, uh, four, uh, we have four uh, uh, walls which will have uh, corresponding boundary condition. So that means I have to satisfy these four boundary condition. Uh, psi zero y evaluated at any time will be equal to psi L H y T will be equal to psi x zero p will be equal to psi x l v t and this all equal to zero, right? So those are not, not very difficult to understand. Those are actually just the four walls around this system, okay? Once you have uh, all those conditions, okay, and the, I, of course I define LH will be equal to five times AH, right, because they are 
uh, five uh, times uh, 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 five uh, strings between uh, the two walls in the horizontal direction. And of course, I also have defined here LV will be four times equal to A times uh, AV. Okay. So once I have all those four boundary conditions in place, that means I cannot arbitrarily choose k value and the phi, right? Otherwise, I will not be able to satisfy these uh, four boundary conditions. Okay. So now we actually will be able to figure out that there will be only four modes, okay, in this two-dimensional problem which will give the same omega. What are the four possible nodes? Uh, what are the four, four possible uh, eigenvectors? Those are A exponential plus or minus I K X times X, exponential plus minus I K Y times Y. Okay, where the K X because of the boundary condition which we have solved that in the uh, one dimensional system. Kx will be equal to nx pi divided by lh, right? In order to make, uh, uh, when, uh, in order to, uh, to, to match the boundary condition at x equal to zero and uh, x equal to lh, and uh, ky will be equal to ny times pi divided by lv, right? That's actually uh, designed to actually match the boundary condition at uh, y equal to 0 and uh, y equal to uh, lv, OK? So you can see that, like what we see before with one dimensional system, after you introduce the boundary condition is not an infinitely long system anymore, but allowed uh, k value, which is the uh, uh, wave number in the x and the y direction, for example, in this case, is actually also uh, uh, become limited. And the uh, only limited number of possible values are allowed, OK? And in this case, n x is allowed to be uh, equal to 1 to until 4, and the ny is equal to 1, 2, and 3 uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, system we are talking about. Any questions so far? Yeah, so, so, that, so, so I was talking about when I choose kx and ky in an infinitely long system, because k, okay, all the possible values of k and kx and ky are allowed because I have an infinitely long system with no boundary condition. And in that case, okay, going back to this dispersion relation, I have the freedom to, okay, so when I increase a little bit kx, I can always decrease a little bit the k y, okay? So, so the question is why that's not the case, right, for the discrete case, okay? As you can see from here, after we introduce the boundary condition, the four boundary conditions actually describe the boundary at the, 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 at the, the four walls, okay? And what is going to happen is that you will also see that the allowed kx value is becoming limited, right? Because if you, you cannot cho arbitrarily choose wavelengths, right? If you choose a slightly longer wavelength, like what we have been trying to do for the infinitely long system, that doesn't match the boundary condition, okay? Therefore, you don't have this uh, degree of freedom to choose uh, you know, slightly higher or slightly lower uh, ky uh, when I have a, when I change the kx. Okay, so you can see that the the allowed value are discrete. Therefore, the number of possible combination of kx and ky is also limited. And in this case, uh, 
uh, it's actually very likely to be limited to be on the four pairs, which is actually plus minus kx and plus minus ky. Okay. All right. So, thank you for the question. Okay. Then once I have those, I can do a linear combination of these four uh, possible uh, eigenvectors. And uh, also at the same time, I will try to uh, match the boundary condition, right? So if I jump forward, basically what you can actually conclude is that psi n x n y, okay, so it's with uh, n x value n y value chosen for for the determination of k x and k y, and if this is actually the, a function a function of x and y, and of course also. Uh, time, right? When I actually also make it isolate as a function of time, this will be equal to some arbitrary constant a, some amplitude an x and y sine an x pi x divided by l h sine and y pi y divided by Lb. OK? And of course, this is actually, uh, you, you can see that this is actually sine, right? It's actually the same as what we have done for the one-dimensional system, right? So if you have a boundary, two boundary conditions at the, the beginning and the end, therefore, the, uh, the corresponding uh, normal mode is always a sine function, right? So that's actually what we have learned uh, uh, from, uh, from the one-dimensional system. And uh, it is also, also the case for the two-dimensional system, and of course we don't have, uh, don't forget this system. Uh, this uh, 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 wave function is actually changing as a function of time, oscillating up and down harmonically. Okay, therefore we have sine omega and x and y times t plus beta, which is a phase to be determined by uh, initial conditions, OK? And you can see that the whole, uh, the whole equation A sine sine is multiplied by a sine omega t plus, phi, uh, plus a beta function, right? So that means the shape is actually going up and down harmonically, right? So the shape is fixed, which is sine times sine. And, uh, the whole thing is oscillating at the same frequency, at the same phase, which is the definition of normal mode, right? Just a reminder. And how do we actually imagine what is actually happening? That brings me to the demonstration, right? So we can actually uh, really uh, visualize uh, how this kind of system will look like by a little uh, simulation, right? So suppose. I choose uh, nx and ny equal to 1 and see what will happen. So this is actually the kind of uh, oscillation you will expect, right? So if you choose nx equal to 1, ny equal to 1, then this is the system, right? Basically, you have sine function with no node in uh, x and y direction, OK? Therefore, if you look at uh, this, this, uh, uh, the, this simulation, you can see that there will be no node in the xy plane. And, uh, and, and all those particles are either going toward you or going away from you, right? In the, only oscillate in the, um, in the z direction, OK, in this uh, simulation. And also, you can see that now I can increase, for example, the kx to be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I can increase the kx by setting an x to be 2 and see what will happen. So what is going to happen is that if I have higher kx in the x direction, so the next uh, possible normal mode is that you have a, a, a full sine wave right, in the x direction. Then what you are going to see is that you are going to see two components in this, uh, 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 in this demonstration. And uh, one, one, is, one, one part of the system is actually moving toward you. 
uh, while the other part, the other half part of the, uh, the system is actually moving away from you, and you can actually see the node uh, or a nodal line in, in this case because we are talking about a two-dimensional system in the middle of the, the distribution. Okay, of course we can actually always go crazy, right? I can set it to uh, uh, really high value. So in this case, I, the highest value I can set is three and four, okay, and see what happened. And this is actually a beautiful uh, shape, which is actually complicated, but understandable, uh, uh, which we can actually see from, from this, uh, this, uh, in, in this demonstration. And all those, uh, all those little particles um, in this system are oscillating up and down uh, at the same angular frequency and also at the same phase. Any questions? Okay, so now we have done the discrete uh, case, right? And uh, of course, we can also go to the continuous case, right? So if we go to a continuous limit, okay, now I can assume that there is a symmetry between a uh, uh, horizontal direction and uh, the vertical direction. I assume that th is equal to tv is equal to t, okay? And also I assume that the length scale in the x direction and the y direction are equal and the length scale is uh, a, okay? In order to make the whole system continuous, okay, I need to increase the number of objects in this system. At the same time, I also need to decrease the distance uh, between all those uh, objects, right? So therefore, I need to have uh, this length scale goes to zero. And uh, what is going to happen is that if I rewrite my omega, okay, which is a dispersion, which is a dispersion relation, what I'm going to get is 4t divided by n times a kx squared a squared divided by 4 plus 4t over ma ky squared a squared over 4, right? This is actually because I'm uh, taking uh, a, uh, ah and av to be equal to a, and uh, also having that to be very, very small value. Therefore, uh, sine uh, theta is roughly just theta, right? Therefore, I can immediately write down this expression, okay? And this will be equal to TA divided by M KX squared plus KY squared, okay? So we are facing exactly the same uh, situation. When I decrease A, I am going to add more uh, objects into this system, right? But I don't want to have an infinitely large mass, right? <coughs> Therefore, I also need to actually fix the ratio of uh, M and A, okay? So that actually when I actually increase uh, the number of uh, objects, I don't actually make the total mass actually goes to infinity, okay? So what I could do is that, I, okay, I can define rho s, which is actually the surface mass density, okay? So the surface mass density is defined as n divided by a squared. And I can also define a surface tension, okay? Surface tension Ts will be equal to T over A, okay? And the, in, in this case, okay, basically, I will be able to control so that when I increase the number of objects, okay, mass will go to infinity, and I have a constant uh, uh, surface uh, tension and constant uh, uh, surface mass density. Okay, if I have defined this two quantity, then this will become uh, T S divided by rho S K X square plus K Y square. And this will be equal to T S divided by rho S K vector squared. Okay, and this K vector is a uh, 
two-dimensional uh, vector. So we are actually uh, almost there to make it continuous. So now I can make A goes to a very small value with fixed uh, Ts and the row S. Very similar to what we have learned from the one-dimensional case. Basically, what we actually found at that time in the one-dimensional case is that uh, n minus 1k matrix become minus t over rho l, partial square, partial x square in the one-dimensional case. Okay? And uh, in the two-dimensional case, without walking through all the detail of mass, basically what we are going to get is partial square, partial t square, psi x, y, it's, it's actually a function of x and y, and the time, right? Because this is actually a two-dimensional system. And this will be equal to uh, v squared, partial square, partial x squared, plus partial square, partial y squared, side x, y, and t. Very similar to what we have done for the one-dimensional system. And of course, I can, I can actually define this as delta squared. Right? And basically, what you are going to get is v square, del square, psi, x, y, and t. OK? So basically, we again see this wave equation. But this wave equation is now a two-dimensional wave equation. OK? And uh, we can also figure out what will be the v value, right? So what would be the velocity? The velocity, which we, we, we will go to be uh, square root of Ts over rho s. Okay? This is actually very similar to what we have done for the uh, continuous case. And uh, in this case, uh, what replace T over rho L is Ts over rho s. Okay? Therefore, what we actually see is that if I increase the surface tension, then the velocity will increase. If I decrease the uh, the mass uh, per uh, uh, uni area, rho s, then I will be able to have a much faster uh, 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 traveling wave on this kind of medium. Okay? And uh, what we can actually immediately also write down is that the psi will be equal, uh, proportional to A sine kx times x sine ky times y in sine omega t plus phi, where omega is actually calculated from the input kx and ky for this, uh, uh, for this uh, 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 standing wave solution. OK? And uh, very similarly, OK, I can also argue that in the three-dimensional case, I can actually follow exactly the same argument. Basically, in the three-dimensional case, as well, we already see in the electromagnetic uh, wave discussion, the three-dimensional wave equation can be written as partial square, partial t squared, psi is a function of x, y, and z, and t. And this will be equal to v squared, uh, partial square, partial x squared, plus partial square, partial y squared, partial, partial square, partial z square, psi is a function of x, y, z, and t. Any questions so far? No? OK, so everything is critically clear, right? OK, so, so this is actually the, the animation which I showed you before already. So this is actually the two-dimensional uh, two, two uh, vibration of membranes. OK, so basically the first one is actually what I have shown you when I choose a very uh, small k value, OK, which actually only make a sign, uh, half of the sign and which match the boundary condition. Then basically you see that uh, there are uh, oscillation which you, you have uh, the middle part, which is either going toward you or going away from you in this continuous system. So basically, the solution 
is actually remarkable the uh, the same as what we have, have seen in the discrete system. Okay, that's actually what I want to say. And also, of course, you can increase the uh, the the k value, and so that you go to the uh, higher uh, 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 frequency normal mode, and you can see that if you have more and more uh, nodal lines, okay, which is actually the the lines describing the the uh, uh, the lines which we, you, you actually have no oscillation okay, at all on the surface. For example, in this case, the nodal line is actually passing through the middle of this figure, right? Because all those little mass, although uh, all the other particles are vibrating like crazy, but the, all the particles on this line, the nodal line, are actually not at all moving because that's actually the actually at, the, at this position, uh, which is actually having uh, one of the sine function equal to zero. Therefore, no matter what you do as a function of time, how you evolve this system, all those uh, particles at that line will not move at all, okay? And this was actually demonstrated uh, from uh, this uh, demo here. Uh, it's actually cut me uh, figures, right? So you can see that uh, in a two-dimensional case, the figures can look uh, very uh, complicated. So basically what is actually showing here is that you have a square plate and uh, it's attached to uh, a, a vibrator. And basically uh, this vibrator can be controlled. Uh, I can change the frequency of that vibration. Okay, when, when I reach uh, uh, resonance, which excite one of the normal mode, okay, then this, um, this plate will be oscillating uh, in a, a, a specific pattern. And, the, and those lines are actually showing you that the plates which you have no oscillation at all as a function of time, right? Because if I, t for example, now turn on this demo again, you can see that if I turn on this demo, You can see that uh, those uh, all the sand on the plate are uh, vibrating because now I'm isolating the, this plate uh, from uh, by the uh, uh, by the uh, vibration generator at the button by the motor at the button. And uh, if I change the oscillation frequency, so you can see that this frequency doesn't match with uh, one of the uh, 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 normal mode frequency, therefore there were not a lot of activity. But if I now change the amplitude, oh, sorry, I change the frequency so that it match with one of the uh, oscillation uh, frequency for the for one of the normal mode of this system, you can see that ha, huh, some really cryptic pattern is formed, right? You can see that oh, it, it have very complicated pattern. And if I put my uh, finger in one of the line here, I don't feel the vibration. But on the other hand, if I put my finger here, I can actually feel that there's a lot of vibration at that point. I can always change the frequency and see what will happen. And you can see that now I increase the frequency. And now I actually trying to excite another mode. Now I need some more sand. You can see that I randomly throw sand on this uh, plate, and you can see that those sand are actually bounce around until it sits on, until it sits on the nodal line, which no vibration actually happen. Okay, so let's go back to so one of the lower frequency mode, which we showed you before. Now the question is, okay, you can see this complicated pattern almost look ridiculous, right? Can we actually reproduce this pattern by our calculation, right? Okay, so we have seen that, okay, I can conclude that the, the normal modes will look like this, right? So therefore, uh, 
I must be able to explain all those patterns which is actually shown on, on that uh, on, uh, in this experiment, right? So that's actually what I'm going to do uh, to give it a try. So, so this is actually a little anim uh, uh, demonstration which I, I sh uh, actually uh, wrote. Uh, so this demonstration actually have uh, the solution uh, to uh, this two-dimensional uh, problem. And also the, the boundary condition is that, uh, or say the, the condition which I actually construct my solution is that I require the center of the plate to be driven, right? So because that's actually what, where I start to vibrate this plate. And I, I drive this plate up and down and see what is going to happen, okay? So from this analytical calculation, you can see that you expect a circle, okay, in, in the middle, and also four lines in uh, which actually uh, cover this uh, 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 circle, and also there are some strange uh, structure at the edge of the uh, of, of the uh, plate, and uh, you can actually compare this calculation to this result. Uh, it doesn't really match. Perfectly, right? So you can see that there are some imperfection, but you do you, you get a ring in the in the middle, and you do see uh, these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight lines uh, produced uh, in, in this experiment. So this is this experiment is not perfect because they are like uh, 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 you know stiffness of this thing and also uh, uh, you know some uh, energy dissipation, etc. <coughs> but you can see that sort of we can actually use our calculation. To explain this pattern, that's really cool, right? And uh, the advantage is that now I have this wonderful uh, uh, simulation. I can put in all the crazy uh, numbers, and you will see that, huh, if I increase the k value, and I can actually really make all kinds of ridiculous pattern out of this. And that all these things can actually be kind of realized by this experiment. So you can see that, for example, I can now also turn on this. And I can actually increase the temperature, uh, sorry, inc sorry, increase the frequency to very high frequency. For example, then I can see that, oh, the pattern really become much more complicating. Right? Now I have a circle and there are many, many more structures which is in the, in the surrounding area. And of course I can again increase, increase and see what happens. I don't know what is going to happen because every time I do this experiment, I get a different pattern. <laughs> okay, now this seems to be a very nice frequency. It's getting harder and harder. You can see that this is, this looks really crazy. Holy macro, right? What, is, what the hell is this? Right? So you can see that all those crazy patterns can, can, be, can be created. And of course, uh, during the break, you, you are welcome to come forward and uh, play with this. So, you can see that we can actually understand sort of the pattern produced from this uh, experiment. That's actually very exciting because that's actually why we are physicists, right? So we would like to know why those patterns are formed. And now you know why those patterns are formed because there are nodal lines in these two dimensional normal modes. And the low sense really love to sit there because you want to sit in a place which you, you don't have a lot of vibration. Ooh, 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 it's not very comfortable, right? So, so you sit in the place which mm, vibrate is your problem, vibrate is your problem. I sit here where there were no vibration, right? <laughs> so that's actually how we actually explain these strange uh, figures which we can see. And uh, just for fun, you can see that I can also generate all kinds of craziness. You, you, you can input all kinds of different NX and MY value, and you get all those wonderful figures for free. Maybe we can actually make some t-shirt with all those figures uh, on the t-shirt, right? <laughs> OK. So we had a lot of fun with this uh, two-dimensional plate. How about 
what will happen if I have a circular plate? Okay, what, what does it do? Okay, unfortunately, I will not be able to solve the two-dimensional plate problem in front of you because that will give you a Bessel function, right? Which is not the end of the world, but it's actually kind of complicated if I put it in the midterm exam. Uh, that's actually not very encouraging, right? So, so, but I can actually tell you what will be the solution. The solution will be a Bessel function. So basically, you will have a, a lot of rings, uh, ring-like structure if I have a circular plate, okay? And I can actually do an experiment which actually shows you the, uh, the behavior of the circular boundary condition and see what kind of pattern can we actually see. So here I have a kind of complicated experiment. Okay. So here I have this ring, which I would like to uh, uh, produce a soap film uh, on, on, the, on, on this ring. Okay. So, so I see if I am successful, kind of. Okay. Now I can put this uh, a soap film in front of um, in front of um, um, in front of the speaker, okay, I can actually isolate the, the, this uh, same film uh, membranes by uh, the speaker. Okay, Ooh, I don't want to destroy everything here. All right, so now I can turn on this so that I, we have light, and of course I will turn on the, the uh, signal generator so that I can hear, uh, I can actually start to vibrate the membranes. And before I do that, I have to uh, turn everything off, right? Hide images, hide, hide. All right, I hope you can see something. Can you? Can you see something on the... Okay, it's kind of difficult to see it. Okay, but that should be there. Okay, now I can turn on... Uh, uh, this uh, uh, speaker, and you can see that there are some pattern which you, is di probably difficult to see. Kind of see it, right? There are some uh, rings you can see on the figure. So you can see that now I have one, two, three, three rings, right? Kind of because I couldn't actually uh, turn off the uh, okay, turn off the light, which is actually emitted from the from the sun, right? Uh -huh. So I cannot turn off sound, therefore you can, you can barely see this figure. Uh, so this is the result of this experiment. And you can see that if I increase the frequency, okay, according to the solution from the Bessel function, you will see more rings uh, got excited, right? So you can see that now I have one, two, three, four, four rings. And of course I can continue to increase, increase and increase and you will see that there are even more rings were produced. It's essentially what I'm doing is actually really trying to vibrate and excite one of the normal mole by this loudspeaker, okay? And uh, you can actually kind of see, I hope you can kind of see it, okay? If you can still see it, that means you, you need to check your eye because the, the membrane is broken. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I think you sort of get this idea, and uh, I'm going to turn off this wonderful machine and, and go back to the, the lecture. So this experiment is kind of hard to reproduce uh, in your study run, right? I think everybody will agree. And uh, there's another one which is actually kind of easy to reproduce, which I would encourage you to try it, okay? So if you have time. So this is actually from uh, Jake. Uh, he actually sent me this wonderful video when I was teaching the uh, AO3 class. They found that they can excite two-dimensional wave in, in this way. Can you see it? It's wonderful. You can see there very high frequency oscillation, which actually excite this two-dimensional uh, wave. And uh, you can see that lots, lots, lots of rings are actually excited. And uh, you can see very clearly from this, 
uh, this uh, simple experiment, what you really need is a cup of water, and you rub it uh, against the surface of a table. Then you will be able to excite all the crazy patterns which we can actually uh, see from this two-dimensional uh, 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 system and uh, with two-dimensional boundary conditions. Okay, so we will take a five-minute break uh, before we enter the next uh, part of the discussion, and uh, we come back at 35. Okay, welcome back, everybody. So what I'm going to do now is to continue the discussion while we actually got started uh, uh, of the two-dimensional and three-dimensional system. And uh, we, have under, uh, we have actually uh, studied uh, the behavior of uh, standing wave, right, or normal mode for, for this two-dimensional system. And what I'm going to do is to discuss with you a two-dimensional Progressing wave. Okay. So I will stick to a really simple example, which are plane waves. Okay. So in, in the case of plane wave, which we actually discuss when actually when we actually discuss the EM waves, you have the following uh, functional form. Psi is a function of R and the T, and this will be equal to A exponential I. K is actually, the K is a vector now, and it's pointing to the direction of the propagation of this plane wave. And this K is dot with, uh, uh, R vector minus omega t, which is the oscillation uh, frequency, angular frequency, and uh, evaluated at a specific time. And uh, this, actually, this expression actually describes a plane wave where uh, the direction of propagation is described by this uh, k vector. And uh, of course, you can actually have the wave front which is actually the peak position of this plane wave, okay? And the, the distance between the peak position, okay, so you, you can imagine that this is like this. Wait a second. This is too wide. Right? So if you, if you look at the, 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 the distance between peak position, that will give you the, the wave length, right? The wavelength lambda will be equal to 2 pi divided by k, right? In this case, it's the, the length of this k vector, OK? Just a reminder about what we actually introduced in the previous, previous lecture. And uh, we were using this to describe electromagnetic wave. And uh, such kind of uh, expression can be also be used to uh, describe sound waves and also uh, uh, vibration on the membranes, etc. progressing waves, okay? So if there are no other median, okay, like what we actually have in this uh, slide, so we have nothing else. I have a membrane with uh, surface uh, tension Ts, and uh, rho s is actually the, the mass per unit area. Then basically this progressing wave it's going to be traveling at the speed of v, which is actually equal to square root of ts over rho s. And uh, I can actually define that to be some constant c divided by n. Okay, so c is actually some constant, and n is actually uh, another, uh, 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 another constant, which is actually the ratio c and n is actually equal to v. And uh, I will need that expression later, only later, not, not now. If I have nothing else, okay, and uh, this, this, actually, this system actually fills the whole universe, then what is going to happen is that this progressing wave is going to be propagating, 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 nothing will change, and uh, until at the edge of the universe, it, it doesn't actually introduce any excitement, right? Okay, so that's what we have already learned from uh, 
from uh, Yen, uh, when we had discussed the electromagnetic interaction, and now the same expression can also be used for the description of the uh, 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 membranes. And then now, to make this problem more exciting, what I'm going to do is to introduce a boundary, right? So the, the boundary is actually in the middle of this slide, and uh, I will assume that the uh, horizontal direction to be uh, x equal to 0, uh, 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 the horizontal direction to be an x direction, and uh, the, the boundary is at uh, x equal to 0. OK? And uh, when, when, this, uh, when you pass this boundary, there's another kind of material with surface tension uh, Ts prime and uh, slightly different uh, mass per unit area, rho s prime. OK? Based on the expression we got for the velocity, we will be able to conclude that v prime will be equal to square root of T prime s divided by rho s prime. And that will be uh, equal to c over n prime. And c is uh, the same constant which we I use for the left hand side system. And n is actually, uh, later you will realize that that's a refraction index uh, in, in the discussion. OK? So the question which I would like to ask is OK, now I have a plane wave, OK, propagating in the first system. And it meets meet the boundary. And uh, the question is, what will happen? OK, when, when uh, I have the incident wave uh, coming into this system. OK, so before that, I also need to write down the dispersion relation, right? So the dispersion relation can be obtained by plugging in the, the uh, normal mode uh, uh, sine function, uh, function into the wave equation, right? So what I can actually immediately obtain is that the dispersion relation omega square is actually equal to v square kx square plus ky square. And you can actually check this expression by plugging in this function into the two-dimensional wave equation, and you will get that expression. OK? And that means omega cannot be arbitrary number. It's actually decided by kx and the ky. OK? Or say, if omega is decided, and the one of the k is decided, then the third uh, number, for example, in this case, kx, is actually decided by the, the dispersion relation which we have here. OK? So coming back to the original problem we are, we are posting, so I have now the incident wave coming into this system. OK? I would like to know uh, what will happen at the boundary, right? when I have two systems with uh, left hand side propagating at the, 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 the speed of the propagation is v, and right hand side speed of propagation is v prime. What is going to happen? <coughs> As you might guess that I am going to get the refractive wave and uh, a transmitted wave, right? So that's actually based on what we have learned from the one dimensional system, right? If I call this the left-hand side and call the right-hand side system uh, right hand, uh, the right-hand side system R, OK? So I can write down the wave function psi L describing the left-hand side. This will be equal to A exponential I K dot R minus omega t. This is actually the, the incident wave. Describing this incident wave. And as you might guess, there should be some kind of refraction, right? So once this wave actually pass through the, uh, the boundary or touch the boundary, there should be some kind of refraction, right? So the refraction, I can actually write it down in this form. I sum over alpha. R alpha is actually the coefficient or amplitude 
uh, as a function of the uh, the normal modes, which, uh, sorry, as a function of the uh, progressing wave uh, 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 wave number, which I assume, and uh, I can actually sum <laughs> over all kinds of progressing wave number. Exponential i, k, alpha times r minus omega t, right? So this is actually a general form of uh, refractive wave. k alpha is de describing the individual, the direction of the individual refractive wave. And alpha is actually uh, labeled in individual refractive wave, but I don't know what would be the functional form for the k alpha for the moment. So therefore, I try to sum over all the, the possible uh, alpha. And uh, I would, would like to figure out what would be the allowed uh, alpha by uh, matching the boundary condition. So in short, the right-hand side term is actually describing the refractive wave. OK? And finally, passing through this boundary condition, let's look at the right-hand side, OK? Right-hand side, psi r, OK, is going to be equal to sum over beta, all the transmission coefficients tau beta times a, which is the original amplitude, exponential i k beta times, uh, uh, times r minus omega t. So again, I don't know how, what would be the behavior of the transmitted wave. Therefore, I sum over all the possible values. And this is actually the functional form for the transmitted wave. OK. I also know that k alpha vector squared will be equal to omega squared rho s over ts. And this will be equal to omega squared v squared, OK? Because of the dispersion relation in the left hand side, right? So basically, if, if you look at the left hand side dispersion relation, k, uh, k uh, the, uh, the, the length square of this uh, k vector will be equal to omega square uh, times v square, right? This is actually just the dispersion relation of a non-dispersive median, right? And also, I can actually figure out what will be the length for the, the allowed length for the k, k beta, right? So the k beta square will be equal to omega square v prime square. Right? Because this wave is, this progressing wave is actually the transmitted wave is actually traveling at the second, in the second uh, 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 medium. Okay? So look at what we have done here. So we have an incident wave. We were wondering what is going to happen. Our physics intuition tells me that you must get the refractive wave. Oscillation frequency should be the same. Otherwise, as a function of time, you cannot match the left hand side and right hand side. And uh, you also get a transmitted wave, right? But I need, need now in trouble because I have so many turns. I'm summing over alpha infinite number of turns, and I don't know what would be the coefficient for the r, r alpha and the tau beta, which are the transmission coefficient and the refraction coefficients. Okay? So what I need to do, as you might guess, is to use the boundary condition, right? So now I'm writing down already the general expression. Now I'm going to use the boundary condition to actually limit the choice of the possible k alpha and the k beta. What is actually the boundary condition? The boundary conditions are uh, that at x equal to 0, OK, let's actually at the position of this line, the membranes doesn't break. Right? Otherwise, uh, there's a, I mean, suddenly uh, the membranes actually break and uh, this 
the end of the uh, of the discussion, right? Like the, what we have done before, right? So the membrane still not break so that the propagation can continue, right? Okay. So what does that mean? This means that if I evaluate psi L and psi R at x equal to zero, psi zero y t, okay. The left hand side will be equal to a exponential i k y times y minus omega t plus summing over all possible alpha r alpha a exponential i k y k alpha y times y minus omega t. Okay, this is the incident wave transmitted wave. Evaluate it at the left hand side, which is the upper uh, formula. And that will be equal to the right hand side, which is actually containing only the transmitted wave. So basically, you have summing over uh, beta tau beta a exponential i k beta y times r minus omega t. And this this expression, this boundary condition, should hold true for the, all the possible y, right? Because the boundary condition is valid at x equal to 0. I didn't specify the value of y, right? So therefore, I can actually put in all the possible, oh, this should be y. Sorry for that. I can actually vary the y, OK? And I will figure out that, huh, if I have ky, not equal to k alpha y. That means the wavelength of the refractive wave and the, the incident wave will be different. If I have ky not equal to beta y, that means the transmitted wave wavelength is going to be different from the in, uh, incident wave. That means no matter what I do as a function of y, the membranes will break, right? Therefore, in order to make this uh, equation valid, the only choice is that when k alpha y will be equal to k beta y and equal to k y. So that means the wavelengths okay, projected in the y direction should be equal for the incident wave, transmitted wave, and the refractive waves. Otherwise, you can actually always move a little bit in the y direction, and the, the membranes will break. OK? So that's actually the condition which you can actually get. And the, the interesting thing is that, OK, based on this expression, k alpha, the length of the k alpha and the length of the k beta is fixed, right? And I also know what will be the component for the y direction. Therefore, that means the x direction and uh, the x direction size for the k alpha x and the ky, uh, k beta x are also fixed because of the dispersion relation. OK, so, so that immediately brings me to the, this conclusion that basically k alpha x will be equal to minus omega square over v square minus ky square. And that will be equal to minus kx. OK, so this is actually the x component of the refractive wave. And the, the transmitted wave k beta x will be equal to square root of omega square over v square minus ky square. If I draw, visualize the relative direction of all the three components, basically, this is actually the di direction of the incident wave, OK? And the, the incident angle is theta. And the, from this expression, you see that the ky is equal to uh, uh, k alpha y. Therefore, you have a refractive wave, but actually only the x direction is changed sign. Therefore, you have a refractive wave with exactly the same angle as the incident, uh, angle, uh, incident angle theta. The, refracted, uh, the refraction angle will be theta as well. And uh, there will be a transmitted 
wave with c top prime. And this is essentially the direction of the k, uh, uh, k prime. And the interesting thing is that the projection to the, to the uh, y direction, the k prime y, has to be equal to the projection uh, of the original incident wave in the, in the y direction. OK? So that means I will be able to conclude that, OK, the, the y components are the same. Therefore, I can conclude that k sine theta will be equal to k prime sine theta prime. OK? I'm kind of running out of time. And if I define already, as I define here, velocity is equal to c over m, and the v prime is equal to c over m prime, OK? What I can actually immediately conclude is that, give me one more minute, is that if I have m equal to c over v, and the m prime is equal to c over v prime, I can conclude that n sine theta will be equal to n prime sine theta prime. Does this look familiar to you? This is essentially Snell's law, right? How many of you haven't heard about Snell's law? There were a few before, yeah, OK. No, no problem at all. Then you learned it, right? So that means if I have two kinds of systems, in my hand, and I will be able to uh, relate uh, the, the, the transmitted wave and according to what I have in the incident wave. And uh, you can see that Snell's law, which were famous for optics, uh, right? Uh, the discussion of optics. And here, I have no knowledge about optics or electromagnetic wave. So in short, what I want to tell you is that we have just proved two <coughs> of the most important laws of the geometrical optics. The refraction uh, angle is equal to incident angle, and the Snell's law without using any information about the dynamics. That means all those laws are coming from purely boundary condition and the waves. Therefore, you will expect that this will work for water wave, sound wave, electromagnetic free wave, et cetera, OK? So we will continue the discussion uh, next time. Thanks for the uh, uh, attention. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I will be here. Hello, everybody. We are going to uh, show you a demonstration, really nice one. To, uh, uh, it's a, it consists of a following uh, uh, setup. So basically, I'm going to place a uh, soft film here. And uh, then uh, behind that, there's a loudspeaker, which I use uh, a signal generator and to actually produce sound wave. And this sound wave is going to uh, oscillate the soft film. And you are going to see the uh, oscillation, or say the normal mode pattern on the screen. OK, so that, uh, that is actually uh, the setup, uh, which we can actually demonstrate you uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, normal modes. So the first thing which I am going to do is to produce a soft film. Now I'm going to put it back into this setup here. You should be able to see the pattern on the screen. Then I'm going to uh, turn on the uh, sound wave generator. You can see immediately that uh, the pattern is uh, on the screen changed because of the sound wave trying to oscillate uh, uh, the soft film. You can actually see it directly from here, but uh, it essentially uh, looks uh, much uh, uh, more prominent uh, on the screen. And now what I'm going to do is to change uh, the, the frequency of the sound wave. And you can see that now I'm changing it to a higher frequency. And you can see that there are more and more 
complicated uh, pattern uh, form on the screen. That is because I am now uh, exciting uh, higher and higher uh, frequency uh, normal modes. And you can see that now I can actually uh, continue and uh, increase the uh, increase the, the frequency, and you can see that. Now we can see that the, the pattern become really, really infinitely uh, uh, complicated. You can see this grid uh, developing, and you can see that uh, basically that's uh, uh, two, basically two uh, sine function multiply each other. One, is, one sine function is in the x direction, the other one is in the y direction, horizontal and the vertical direction. And you can see really a uh, beautiful uh, pattern forming due to, the, uh, due to this uh, solution we derived uh, during the lecture. And uh, the higher uh, frequency uh, I go, I can see more and more uh, complicated uh, pattern. Or, uh, many more uh, li lines uh, developing uh, on the screen uh, due to the oscillation of the uh, soap film. You can see now we have even more lines and it's actually getting more and more difficult to see the pattern because now the lines are really close to each other. The nodal line uh, we can see uh, clearly uh, uh, on the screen. Now I'm going back down to the lower frequency, and you can see that uh, at low frequency oscillation, the number of lines is actually uh, smaller, and, uh, and uh, that is because of the smaller oscillation frequency and uh, the longer uh, wavelengths of the normal modes.